All right. Well, first of all, hello everyone, and welcome to our second class, second lecture, which is how to play like a pro. Okay. And what I wanted to say is it's not easy to play like a pro. On, on the contrary, it's really, really, really tough. Now, being a professional chess player, uh, has a lot of upsides and downsides. One of the upsides is you're your own boss. Uh, but one of the downsides is that uh, things don't often go according to your plans. Ooh, not good, not good. In professional chess, uh, you have to have your opening novelty. The opening novelty is to a chess professional what a fast draw was to the Old West uh, gunslingers. So uh, you work really, really hard to work on your opening chess novelties. And um, what if the guy doesn't fall into them? Huh? I remember that when I was coming up as a professional, I had worked out some really, really great opening novelties. And I get to the board and I try to play them, and my opponent would deviate. Couldn't get the novelty. And then somebody else, a year later, played it. I was like, no, that was my novelty. Oh, why, why, why? Uh, so sometimes you work really hard, you prepare for a tournament, and nobody plays the variation that you prepared for. What to do? What to do? It's really, really, really tough. And then somebody else gets the novelty. So we're going back to the candidates tournament of uh, two weeks ago, uh, three weeks ago, and. Uh, Here's a huge matchup early in the tournament between Levon Aroni and his white against Vladimir Kramnik, who's black. And as Vladimir explained after the game, it was about two years ago that he had this opening novelty all prepared, and he never, ever got a chance to play it. And wouldn't you know it, in the candidates tournament, one of the biggest uh, stages in chess, his opponent walks into it. Here's one example of a opening that I learned when I was very young. I was just starting uh, chess, and um, I'm supposed to be white. My opponent's supposed to be black, and they're supposed to let me do this. Ooh, when I first saw this variation, uh, and uh, it has a specific name, this checkmate in pattern. I thought this was just fantastic. The queen, you know, the most powerful piece on the board, I'm sacrificing my queen. So bishop takes d1. Can you see the checkmate in two? Exactly. Yeah, it is Legal's. Yeah, that's right. It is Legal's checkmating pattern. So I learned this. I memorized this. And you know, in 4,000 tournament games, nobody even came close <laughs> <laughs> to falling into my brilliant, 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 not even close. I mean, it was just terrible, terrible. Nobody ever played this stuff. What could I do? Anyway, uh, Levon Aroni in white. Uh, Vladimir Kramnik Black, E4. This is a, actually <coughs> a surprising opening move by Levon. So Levon is really known for knight F3, C4, Catalan, Reddy, Barxa openings. And E4 is rare. So there was somebody, I forget who, who did the o ceremonial opening first move, the honorary guest, you know, comes. And uh, E4, that that uh, person has played. And uh, 
you know, uh, every smiles all around, and you know, Vladimir Kramnik is expecting uh, Levon to retract the move and play his normal stuff, and boom, it stays on the board. And it's like, whoa, okay. So of course, Vladimir has uh, justifiably uh, a great reputation as an opening specialist, and in particular, the Berlin defense. He used it famously in the year 2000 to neutralize Garry Kasparov in their world championship match. Okay, so obviously the Berlin will not come as a surprise to Levon, and Levon wants to play uh, a D2, D3 variation. Uh, in, the, in, the, uh, in the famous 2000 uh, match, Garry Kasparov as white went in what is called the Berlin ending. There's a four sequence of moves that result in the trade of queens. Now this was a brilliant choice by Vladimir Kramnik because Garry Kasparov is one of the most fearsome attacking players in the history of the game. And literally, you know, in the first ten moves, the queens come off the board. So what a great way to try to neutralize Gary's uh, attacking potential by trading queens. And it worked out, uh, I'm not going to say to perfection, but it worked out really, really well for Vladimir. So um, Levon wants nothing to do with that ending. He'll play d3, bishop c5, and bishop takes c6. Well, this is a kind of a, a latest wrinkle. Uh, the professional players of today are having a real, real problem getting an advantage with white in the Berlin. For example, in this position, should you want to castle, which you normally would, then there's this move knight d4. Uh, attacking, pardon me, attacking this bishop on uh, b5, so there's no time to capture this pawn, and after the knight trade, bishop takes, c3, bishop back, the position is considered dead even. Black is going to play c6 and d6. So uh, the other thing that Levon can do is he can stop black from playing knight d4 with the move c3, castles, and um, lots and lots of tournament games have gone from this exact position. And again, white has really been struggling to find an advantage. So Levon comes with the, the latest wrinkle. Bishop takes c6, takes. Now, of course, this pawn is not up for grabs yet. You can't play knight takes e5 as much as you would, as highly desirable as that may be. There's a move queen d4. And now, thanks to the threat of check mate in one, as well as queen takes, there's the line that ends up in black's favor. Oops. So you can't go for the pawn. That would get you get your hand caught in the cookie jar. Castles. Okay, but now, now the pawn is up for grabs. Defense, queen e7. Levon, of course, expected this, and he says, okay, what I want to do with white is I want to bring my minor pieces into play and attack this pawn on e5, knight d2 to knight to c4, then I want to play bishop e3. White voluntarily gave up his light squared bishop, so white is trying to make an argument that black's light squared bishop is not going to find it an effective square. Like, is this square that great? It's okay. This square is probably a whole lot better, but be careful, that pawn needs protection. So Levon says, I'm going to play h3, and I'm going to leave it up to you. Yes? 
Now this is where playing like a pro comes in. This position uh, has been played before. Uh, there's been a lot of experience with it. And uh, Kramnik, two years before the candidates, had had a hard look at this position. Again, he's a Berlin specialist. And he came to an extraordinary realization. The best way of meeting an attack on the flank is an attack in the center. Okay. Vladimir began to reason that he wants to attack on the flank, but he knows that a counterpunch in the center could really destroy an attack on the flank. But he reasoned that the center is for the moment closed. It's not ready to be burst open and he can attack on the flank. He would really love to play the move g7 to g5. And let's assume for the moment that the pawn cannot be captured. It could not be captured. Then he wants to play g5, g4, force the trade, and the bishop will come to g4, and he will have accomplished his goal, which is getting his c8 bishop, the light squared bishop, Okay. He played the move rook g8. Ooh. Ooh. What's up with that move? Okay. So a move like rook g8, especially as played by Vladimir Kramnik, should really get your spidey sense uh, tingling. Like, okay, this is weird, what's my opponent planning to do? Well, it's pretty darn obvious. The opponent is planning to go g5, g4. So if you play, for example, a developing move, to be recommended, by the way, development is good, g5, knight c4, g4, blasting away. If you take and you have it in your mind that, oh, you'll just play g3, your next move will be king h2. Everything was copacetic. Splat. Rook takes g3. Awesome. This bishop on c5, of course, pins the pawn on f2. Cannot uh, capture the rook. OK. So Levon, of course, sees that. He doesn't want to allow that. Then he starts thinking, well, how big is white black's threat? I want to break in the center. I want to play d3, d4 kind of moves. And uh, OK, oh, pardon me. Uh, let's imagine that Levon had played um, c3, new variation, g5, come and get him. OK. Now let's imagine bishop takes g5. What do you think black should play? h6 is a good move. Everybody like h6? After h6, bishop takes f6, queen takes f6, king h1. Well, you are a pawn down. Is there? Uh, a big follow through. I don't see one. Bishop takes h3, right. You do that first. Now on g takes h3, h6. And we can see that white's king has been compromised and black is ready to go castles. And after recapturing the bishop, he's going to have a very, very powerful attack indeed. So um, in anticipation of bishop takes h3, king h1. Knight h5. OK, now this whole line with g5, unfortunately, does not deliver as the goods. First of all, since there's no bishop takes h3 in the position, 
White is not even obliged to capture the knight. White could even simply maintain the pin. And you're just a pawn now. So, uh, yeah, spoiler alert. Uh, so, black needs to prepare the move g5. He plays the move knight h5 so that the queen can help protect the, the g5 square. And Vladimir reasons that the knight potentially could land on a really good square uh, near Levon's king. C2, C3. Now Levon is ready to strike in the center and try to refute uh, this premature kingside attack. G5, in for a penny, in for a pawn. Uh, a pawn. Knight takes E5. Ooh. Ooh. What do we think about this one? G4. G4. Okay, well, first of all, if we take the knight, this uh, queen on D1 has made a discovered attack against the knight. So queen takes, queen takes is actually working out really good for white. So knight takes e5, g4. Ooh, things are getting on a uh, boil. Now, black just wants to go queen takes e5, thank you very much. Also, he's angling for g4 <laughs> takes h3 and with the threat of that. Um, can you guys spot a checkmate that might occur after knight takes g4? Yes? Uh, with the g4 Yes, sweet. And that queen is about to land on h1, protected by the knight. Again, the knight can't be captured. We see why this bishop is so very effective on c5. Now, essentially, up to this move g4, this had all been spotted two years before by Vladimir. This was his secret weapon. He's hoping to catch somebody in it. He never had this opportunity. And especially Levon, who isn't even an E4 player, has walked right smack dab into his professional uh, preparation. Okay, Levon's facing a lot of issues here. Uh, Queen takes e5 is becoming a very serious threat. g4 takes h3 is a very serious threat. And he's got to do something. Yes, Uman? Okay. d4. d4. Okay. Bishop's attack. The bishop drops back again. Now you can't take on g4 for a much more simple reason. Now you, you still have a checkmate, but this time it will be checkmate on the h2 square thanks to this bishop now supporting the queen. So that, that pawn on g4, untouchable. But look at white's army. I mean, ex except for this errant knight that somehow is on e5, everybody's on the first rank. Not good, not good. <laughs> you know you've lost the opening battle when all of your uh, pieces are still in their barracks. They haven't got in into, th into the game. So Levon does his best. He's trying to uh, keep uh, the king side as closed as possible. G2, G3. Bishop takes, pawn takes, queen takes. So Vladimir has won back his pawn, but the threats to White's king are still there. There are ideas of sacrificing a knight. Knight takes g3, followed by queen takes g3. This pawn, well, even though 
there's an open E file, it would be hanging with check. And Levon said, you know what? I just want to get out of here intact. Let me trade queens. Well, one of the cardinal guidelines, it's not a rule, but it's a very, very good guideline. When you're attacking your opponent, try to avoid trading off your attacking pieces. So queen takes d4 was a very reasonable move to trade and to take a pawn. But Levon had said, okay, uh, my king is relatively safe. I'm down a pawn, but it's not the end of the world. The pawn on h3 isn't going anywhere. And in the meantime, knight c3, I'll have good development. Yes, please. Knight takes g3 now. Yes, first of all, it is legal. Very, very important to check it out. Queen takes g3. I think there's a move queen e3. We could still probably continue, right? Queen h4. Some, uh, some devilish um, attacking possibilities. What I think white really is desperate to do is to trade queens <laughs> on the board, <laughs> you know, just to try to keep offering that trade of queens. What Vladimir did is he just said, okay, I'll back up with my queen, no harm, no foul. I still want to keep my attacking options and maybe on a good day, my rook can even come to d8 with a tempo. Maybe I'll play b6, bishop b7, c5, or rook to d8. And uh, in the meantime, white still has to solve what's going on on the king side. Well, Lavon said, let me shut down the king side as best I can. C5, attacking the queen. So where can white move his queen? If he moves it to d5, well, thank you very much. I have this offside knight over here, queen d5. I'll just retreat with a gain of time against the queen. So queen d5 is just a terrible move. Again, this pawn on e4 is hanging, so we need a good square for the queen. Which one? Queen a4, check. Um, but the bishop would develop with a gain of a tempo. If you put your queen on e3, which is completely reasonable, of course, I think black's plan will be to develop with bishop d7 with the idea of bishop c6 to castle and then to focus on this pawn on e4. Also, the queen on e3 does interfere with the natural development of this bishop. <coughs> Bless you. So maybe the bishop would like to come out. Levon played queen c4. Bishop e6, and here Levon did make an error. He played queen b5 check. Uh, I don't like white's position. I think he's been thoroughly outplayed, and black is for choice. But he had to, uh, he had to step back with his queen, queen e2, and black is going to castle, and black is going to eventually start. Oops, excuse me. Black is eventually going to start to play moves like bishop d5 and f5. Mm. It's all very nice. So bishop come out, check, c6. Where are you going to put your queen, dude? Queen a4. So somehow in this little dance with the queen, uh, Levon had convinced himself that, uh, oops, that the pawn on a7 was a potential weakness. The queen defends the uh, pawn on e4, and that was that. This was somehow uh, the most suitable line of play. 
suggestions for black? B5, a very attractive looking move. Wait just a second, let's just see new variation. I think the problem is that here, now there is this direct threat. And maybe um, the queen is annoying on A6. Another suggestion? Yes? F5. F5. Bravo, bravo. F5. Essentially, Vladimir is just trying to get at the guy's king. He wants some variation that might go takes, bishop check, king, for example, here, queen to e2, eyeballing not only the rook, but maybe an opportunity to line up on this diagonal. And then after a move, oops, excuse me, like knight d2, castles, and white is stuck. White is stuck for uh, moves. F5. Oops, excuse me. F5 and bishop g5. Okay, development is good. Comes a little late, but development is good. Yeah, sack. Just sacrifice that exchange. Mongo. Now comes a key, key, key moment. What's the follow up? What's the follow up? I notice everybody was brave in sacrificing the exchange, but now you've got to get, make a key follow up move. Mm. Oh. Queen takes g5 is a nice move. Pardon me? b5, maybe the same issue as before, though. Queen a6, and we got some issues. Boy, you're, you, you're definitely in berserk mode. Let's sacrifice away. Let's sacrifice away. Queen takes g5 is a very decent looking move. So I have this theory in chess, okay, and it basically goes like this. Sometimes I play really, really, really badly. Like I'm just, I can't even recognize myself. I put my pieces in awkward and poor positions. So having gotten myself into a mess by putting my pieces on bad squares, I try to justify why they're there, right? I, I look for variations which make the piece that appears to be stupid to actually be wonderful in this position the knight on h5 obviously does not want to be there. It wants to be on f3. It wants to be on e4. Young man. Yes. Suddenly this knight that is super stupid stuck off on the side of the board, when you follow up with the move f4, ruh -roh, suddenly this knight is playing an enormous role uh, obviously, this pawn on g3 is under attack. This queen can now uh, happily capture this pawn, and even worse damage is to come. We can imagine that g3 is our new target, right? We're just focusing our energy on g3. But we can imagine that black would like to castle and go rook to d3. Ooh, and g3 is falling. Queen comes back to d1. Okay, uh, Levon is, you know, really scrambling to, to now trying to save the game. Rook to d8. Queen takes g5 is a very good move. Takes on g3 is a very good move. In this position, it's actually black who's simply winning the game, and it's a question of style now. How do you want to win? I must say I would be very attracted to taking on g3 as well as queen takes g5. But in fact, you know, when you're having a party, invite everybody. 
invite everybody, make sure everybody's coming to the party. And that rook on the A8, you know, it's not uh, a member of the party. You gotta bring it into the game. So rook to D8, gaining a tempo on the queen, queen to C1. So what did Vladimir play now? Knight takes G3 looks very attractive. Are we sure it wins though? Or after que queen G5 first? That looks really good. Queen G5 first, followed by um, more, more guys. How about rook D3? Ooh, how about rook G3? Planting that rook in the center of the board, threatening all kinds of nasties on G3. You said G3. On G3. On, yeah, rook to D3, sorry. Rook to D3, hitting the G3 pawn. Ooh, some very attractive, you know, when you have such a wonderful attacking position, you know, uh, it's easy to find good moves. <laughs> Takes? It's coming, right? Knight to a3. And now this double x clam move, right? No. Take it to d3. Rook to d1. And now we have the big moment. So essentially this knight on g on h5 is really participating black, pardon me, white could never recapture the pawn because then the knight would capture on g3 with a check and that would be winning. Um, the rook has penetrated. Here I was expecting a move like rook f3 to be honest. I thought that was a really good move. But Vladimir had seen deeper, he'd seen uh, a nicer uh, continuation. He, he reasons that his bishop on e6 really wants to get into the game. Is there a difference between bishop to f5 and bishop to d5? I like the move bishop d5 a lot more. I'm, I'm, I'm really partial to absolute pins. Right? When I get the opportunity to uh, make an absolute pin, it's almost a 90 percenter that I'm going to choose it over a move like bishop f5. I think they're both really good moves. I just love this bishop d5. And you're lining up with the king on the diagonal, young man. Exactly. So what do you think? What do you think? What's, what's going on? How come white can't just take the bishop? What do you think? What do you see that would be really, really bad for white? Queen e4 check. Now there's only one square that white can move his king, right? And now what's the really bad news? Knight f4 is very strong, but you have something even more forcing. So your job when you're on the, ta on the attack is to remember um, you always look at the most forcing moves first. So the most forcing moves are always checks, right? Because you've got to answer a check. And the second most forcing moves are captures. So knight f4 is a good maneuvering move. I like that move. Yes, G takes F2 check. And then what would you do? King takes F2. Queen F3 check. Okay, and then what if I go back? Queen to G3 check. You look at the most forcing moves first, and they're always checks. Another check. Bravo, bravo. Very good, very good. No choice. Uh, 
Okay, now this is interesting because this is a stylistic thing. When I play blitz online, so I've got certain patterns where I, I make these major piece mates. So queen h2, rook g1, but I would just play rook g2, queen h1. So which one, I mean, it's checkmate in two, right? <laughs> but I, I'm used to the rook g2, queen h1, and checkmate. So that's why you can't take the bishop. You answered your own question. What do you need me for? Bishop to d5. Okay, you can't take the bishop. What are we going to do? We're in trouble, big time. Okay, let's see. He played f3. So why didn't, so first of all, why didn't he take the take on d3? Why didn't he take the rook? Let me ask you a question. Because you, well, I'm not sure about, I don't know what I'm up actually. Are you sure you want to play bishop takes e4? Queen takes e4 check. Now I'm threatening queen to go to h1 checkmate. You have to play f3. Now what do you do? Queen takes d3 and this is a, yeah, this is a complete uh, winning variation for white. So that's why Levon didn't take the rook. That's why he didn't take the bishop. He played f3. Rook to f1. The same thing is happening. The, the rook to e1. Okay, sorry, just a second. New variation. Uh, rook to e1. Okay. So, new variation. Yep. Okay. Bishop e4 is really good. G3 takes f2, attacking the rook. That's really good. But let's look at the checks first, right? So we look at the check first, and then the king comes to... Um, Okay, check, king. Which well, there's, a, there's three checks, and you're just gonna throw them out there. Queen, f7, check. King has to drop back. Rook g3, check. Bravo. King here. Yeah, checkmate. Ooh. So now we understand why he can't take the bishop. He can't take the rook. Can't play rook e1. He came up with f3, trying his best to block this light squared diagonal that his king is um, upon. Okay. So you got lots of choices here. Lots and lots and lots of choices. What are you going to do? G2 check. I think he's supposed to play king G1. I don't think he should. I know, I know. Don't you hate that when the guy does? G2, king G2, GF, king something, and then bishop G4. Yeah, no, this would be kind of playing easy. This would make. Yeah, yeah, exactly. This would make. Uh, Black's life a little easier. So, what did Black do? What did Black do? Take my bishop, take my rook. Whichever one you want to do. Now the problem is, if we take the rook, push somebody. Queen takes here. Mate. If you play rook e3, check. Mate. <laughs> I did, did, this should have been in the earlier lecture, The Secret Life of a Pawn. <laughs> Look at those pawns. <laughs> no, no, no. 
I, I would go to the bathroom, uh, crawl out the bathroom window, and like run home to mom. <laughs> okay, uh, F3. Oops, sorry, F3. G takes F3, Levon's move. What are you going to do? What are you going to do? All of these checkmates staring you in the head. Took the bishop. Hmm, what did Vladimir play now? F2 looks like a very strong move. F2, G2 check. Maybe the king can go to G1, I'm not sure. Queen E2, I really, really like because when the, oops, excuse me. Queen E2, I really, really like because when the queen posts up on E2, uh, you got a, a two checkmating threats. Now, I noticed, Mr. Ken West, that you were the one who came up with Queen E2, and in the Bill Wright, you know, St. Louis Open, you managed to lose your queen <laughs> in a couple of the games. So I was waiting for you to come up with the queen sacrifice, and you did very well. <laughs> Rook to E1. Now, ooh, G2 check. I think Levon resigned, which is a kind of a pity. Because it's clear if we play king here, well, that makes white, black's life very simple. F2 check, and you could probably like double checkmate or something. Can we put bishop? Ooh, I'm not sure that bishop, ooh, maybe not mate. I mean, I'll be. I'm not sure. I think it may be wait, actually. You're right. But OK. But I, would, I was a little bit disappointed, because Levon understands that he's actually the victim of a brilliancy. And I was hoping that he would play the move king h2. Now what do you guys do? Mm -hmm. Correct. Nice. You just play g2 so that you could get rid of the pawn with a double check. How cool, how, how monstrous is that? I mean, if you could get away, I know. <laughs> I know, you're right. Queen g2 check would be checkmate, except it's illegal. The rook. Yes. So well, how do you win? What's the winning sequence? F2, check, hold on. No, if I go king h2, well, that's easy. That's a, that's discover check, and oh, that, that's terrible. Uh, uh, how about king h1? Just a second. Whoa, what are we going to do? F1 promote, that is a checkmate in two, no question. I thought that uh, this was the most, uh, let us say, vicious. <laughs> it's not often that you get double checkmated by two queens. <laughs> and, and it's sort of like, oh my gosh, you know, this is horrible. With one being pinned in an absolute way as well. Uh, I think that if uh, Levon had allowed this finish, he would have been the one getting <laughs> the applause because it's a, it's a very, very, very nice game. So here it is. You know, the life of a professional. You know, you got to live and die by your novelties. You come to the tournament games. You're super, super well prepared. And like Legal's mate, I never got a chance to play it. Now... Again, this, had, this whole idea of rook g8 and g5 had been sitting in Vladimir's pocket, his war chest, for better part of two years, and he just knows somebody's going to discover it before him, <laughs> before he gets a chance. And 
on the biggest stage, bang. And this will happen again. Oh yes, and it will happen, of course, again and again. That uh, you know, that's why you work so hard so you can get an opportunity like this. The whole problem is that sometimes you know your opponents just don't cooperate like they should. You know, like they're just not, they're mean persons. Thank you all for coming to tonight's lecture. Appreciate it.